We knew. Eye has not seen, ear, ear has not, not heard. heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of the man, heart of man, the things that God has prepared wow. for. If we really knew that and embraced that and believed it, a lot of things would change. I, I think this is where <laughs> the, the, the fruit of our fearless faith uh, is, is seen and, and enjoyed. If we could really look forward to the finish line, being what the scriptures say that it is, then it is something to rejoice. Let's talk a little bit about, about story <laughs> okay. uh, be, because you're an expert in this. I love the beauty of storytelling. There's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end. Sometimes there's one, two, three acts. There's a protagonist and an right. antagonist and there's struggle that really, really makes for a great story. It's in the struggle that character is built. There's where you have hope and, and there's where you have triumph and death and resurrection. But it's always the ending of the story that seems to maybe matter most, maybe even more than the beginning of the story, uh, you need to have a great ending or you close the book and go, oh, well, that was lame. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, God is the great author <clears throat> and the greatest storyteller. History right. itself is his story. We're somewhere in the middle chapter of that book of his and, and we want the ending to just stick. And his story ends pretty cool. Yeah. The, the, the scripture. Why is it really that cool. the ending of the story, more than anything else, is perhaps the most important? Well, honestly, that's a nice segue into Finish Line, the book that I've just written, because that is incredibly important. You and I know people who, who do okay through their lives, but they don't finish well. They hit the finish line, and it's a disappointment. Mm. It's a letdown. It's an anticlimactic. But the ending <laughs> of the story is so important, and... And that's what we're gonna talk about today is that God's got an ending to our story here on earth. Exactly. And when you wrote this book, Finish Line, uh, you, you weren't just um, speaking in a vacuum or, or just uh, relating some, some research data. Right. This came from your own personal experience. It talk did. about that. It did. Well, in 2012, my wife, Bobby, and I have a picture of you two in taking- I, I remember, in the, I remember in taking In the spring it. of- 2014, um, and it's just the two of you, and you're both smiling. In seven months, she was in heaven. So she was in the middle of chemo at that time, so she had very short hair. But the story of my late wife, Bobby, and what she did with the diagnosis that was terminal is really at the heart of what I'm trying to say in this book. Mm. And that is, Bobby's death and the way she dealt with death completely Im eliminated my fear of death. I mean, that sounds really crazy, but it's true. I was there when she was diagnosed and I was there when we said goodbye. And it really is an amazing story. Mm. Not many people have a death experience that is like this. And I'm deeply grateful. It's, it's God's grace that gave me the chance. But so my daughters, I have two daughters. Uh, today, Missy is 52 and Julie's 49. But they came in to the house. We lived in Orlando, Florida. They came in on a Monday morning. We spent the day together. And Bobby had, is in a hospital bed in our house. And she was totally lucid. I mean, I have video of her hugging them when they came in. Incredibly sweet. So we spent all day talking, mm. laughing, telling stories. So that night, I went to bed. I had been doing this for 30 months. And... I'd never been so tired in my whole life. It was an honor for me because I was healthy enough to help yeah. to be your primary yeah. caregiver. But I went to bed. Missy came and woke me up an hour and a half later and said, Bobby's calling for you. So that was Monday night. Tuesday morning, we got up, we woke up, we had devotions. Bobby read through the Bible 35 times in her life. Wow. And I had a copy of the one-year Bible that was hers. that was filled with notes and underlining and there's so many things I could tell you about her and her love for the Lord, her love for mm. his, his word. So I, I read a passage. Bobby said, I, I underlined that, didn't I? And I said, yeah, you did. She said, I wrote a note in the margin, didn't I? I said, yeah, you did. And I read her what she had written yeah. in the margin, yeah. like the date and then something else. So the hospice nurse came. She came twice a week for about 20 minutes. She came. Bobby said, hi, Enid. And Enid said, hello, Miss Bobby. And they were back and forth. So Enid sat down next to the bed. And she put the cuff on Bobby's arm, you know, and blew it up and let the air out. Yeah. Get her blood pressure. And she said, your blood pressure is, and I don't remember the, num the numbers, but Bobby said, that's really low, isn't it? Enid said, yes, yes, Miss Bobby, that's very low. 
So Nina reached over to get her, take her pulse. So she did this on one wrist and then she moved to her other wrist. Bobby said to her, you don't feel a pulse, do you? Enid said, no, Miss Bobby, I don't feel a pulse. This is October 28th, 2014. So Bobby said to me, would you put the bed back? Cause it was a hospital bed. So I put it back and she turned to me. I was sitting right there next to her in a chair and she took me by the shirt and she pulled her, my face in right next to hers. My nose was two inches from hers. And she said, I love you so much. And she died. Just like that. In fact, Missy, my daughter, said to the nurse, is she dying? The nurse said, no, she's dead. She's dead. She's gone. She put her hand on Bobby's chest and she said, wow. she's not breathing. Her heart wow. has stopped. So that, that, was, that was the goodbye of this person that I had been married to for almost 45 years. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, that personal story uh, of, of Bobby's passing. And Robert, I, I have been so inspired by you and by Bobby and by your story together uh, because it's so infused with hope. Yeah. And you talk about that in your book, approaching this finish line with hope. You have chapters in there uh, like dead, not dead. Uh, you talk about Jesus's finish line. Right. Uh, the, the line he, he, yeah. he spoke at the finish, it is finished. That's right. Why is hope hmm. so central to your perspective of the finish line? Well, because it's truth. So Bobby's favorite verse, in fact, when I signed this book for folks, I, I signed it, 1 Corinthians 2.9. <clears throat> okay, here's what it says. I has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Mm. So Bobby was an artist, I has not seen. She was a musician, ear has not heard. She was a dreamer. She was a storyteller. Neither, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Because we know Jesus, because we have laid our sins at the foot of the cross and he has saved mm. us, we have something to look forward to. I mean, so how does it feel when you go to bed some night and you know the next morning something amazing is going to happen? You are, you're, you're thrilled. Excited. You can you're hardly sleep. You're looking forward with anticipation. That's heaven. That's Randy Alcorn who was kind enough to give me an, an endorsement for this book and really knows more about heaven than any civilian, <laughs> than any mortal man. And, and he loved the book because he knows because of his writing and he's written 50 books. But the anticipation of heaven changes everything, changes everything. You talk about um, a, a spoiler alert in your book. You say heaven can be yours. Right. And, and you speak about the fact that that heaven is our real home. What do you mean by that? What does that actually mean that heaven is our real home? Well, this is, somebody said, I think Dr. Ken Boa, but probably others have said that we are living in the land of the dying and we're on our way to the land of the living. Mm. So I finished the book with a story about Dr. Ed Heinsohn, who taught, who taught at Liberty for many years. And a lot of his work was in Revelation. And he was actually in a hospital and it was surrounded by his family and they did what Christian families do, sing and so forth. And then they realized that Dr. Heinsohn is about to die. And the whole family, this, I've never heard of this before, but it is so cool. His whole family realizing, kids, grandkids, in this room that Dr. Heinsohn was about to step into heaven. And they began to cheer. I tell the story in the book of Rick Hansen, who was a, a paraplegic, who went 26,000 miles on his wheelchair, he's Canadian, and he finished at a stadium in Vancouver with 50,000 people screaming their mm. heads off as Rick goes across the finish, the finish line, line, celebrating. And so Ed Heinsohn's family is in his hospital room. And don't you know, the nurses are going, what is going on? What is going on? on? They're <laughs> cheering on this guy's death. <laughs> I love that story because if we knew, eye has not seen, ear, ear has not, not heard. heard, neither has it entered into the heart of the man, heart of man, the things that God has prepared wow. for them. If we really knew that and embraced that and believed it, a lot of things would change. I, I think this is where <laughs> the, the, the fruit of our fearless faith uh, is, is seen and, and enjoyed. If we could really look forward to the finish line, being what the scriptures say that it is, 
then it is something to rejoice over and to look it forward is. to. If I knew I was going to get on a cruise ship and I was headed to the Middle East or if I was headed to Europe or someplace exotic and wonderful and it was going to be the best time ever with all of my favorite people, I would be so excited. I'd be like, kids, I'm packing my bag. That's right. Here they wouldn't go. be upset. They would be excited for me. <laughs> That's exactly Even what we're talking I about. Even though I know they'd miss me, right. they'd want me to go. I want to look at heaven that way. Hey, we're halfway through this interview. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share this video with a friend. Now back to takeaways. Charles Spurgeon once said, a man is helped to live by remembering that he must die. Wow. Why do you think he said that? Is that true? Yeah, it is true. And it's the truth. I mean, it's true. It's a truth. And it is the truth, right? So Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life. You know, John 11, Jesus has this conversation with Martha about her brother's death. And Jesus says, you're not gonna, I mean, he's not dead, he's sleeping, right? Yeah. So in fact, yeah. that's, that's one of my great, we talk about, that's one of my favorite scenes in the Bible because it's about death. So Jesus is two days walk from Bethany and he gets the news that Lazarus is sick. So I mean, it took a runner, that wasn't, you know, he didn't, Somebody didn't text it. Didn't took text a runner it. two days to get there. So by the time actually the runner says Lazarus is dead, Lazarus is dead. Jesus knows that, right? Yeah. But it takes his time to get back, right? So why, if if your friend is sick and dying, you're going to get on a plane. You're going to get there as fast as possible. The, this story needed Lazarus to die. Why? Because Jesus knew that he could raise Lazarus from the dead. And so there's this group of people, the shortest verse in the Bible, right? Jesus wept, John 11:35, 35. And, and Jesus is weeping over the death of his friend and also probably because of the despair of the people that were wailing and crying. But then Jesus says, remember what he says? Lazarus, come forth. One of my favorite preachers, Chuck Swindoll. Mm -hmm. I think he was the first one I heard say this. Jesus had to say, Lazarus, come forth. Otherwise the graves would have emptied in the whole graveyard. He had to identify this one by calling him by name. Mm. Isn't that a great, mm. I love that. Cool, <laughs> yeah. cool, I like That's that. That's Chuck's idea, not mine. Robert, you, you, you have uh, th this idea in your book that some of the characters in the Bible are finish line guys, guys like Abraham or Simon Peter. Uh, wh why do you say that? Because their whole life, you study their whole life, you read about what they did, what they said, how they acted, and you realize that they had the end in mind. Right? Mm. And, there, and there are some that are disappointments. So Solomon is a disappointment. He didn't finish well. Or Gideon, one of my heroes, Judges 7, one of my heroes in the Bible is Gideon, and he didn't finish well. Do you know that? So if, when, when you put the lens on these guys and... And we said this earlier, Kirk, that the, the finish of your race is more important than anything else in your life. So thief on the cross. So, I mean, he didn't go to a Bible study. He didn't know the catechisms. Hmm. All he said was, remember me. He didn't even have the, the four spiritual laws down. No. He said, remember me. And what did Jesus say? You're Today, at. you'll be with me in Today. paradise. He finished well. He finished well. Jeremiah 17, 9 talks about the, deceitful, the deceitfulness and the brokenness of my heart. And the moment that I think that I can live without the danger of looking at that, with, without the specter of that, without the possibility of that, then God's grace won't be the same. Mm. I need to know that every moment of every day, I'm resting in his forgiveness and in his grace and then I can get on with it. But yeah. without that, um, I, I'm not going to not only finish well, but I'm not going to live yeah. this abundant life that he promised us. Robert, how should our uh, looking forward to the inevitable of a finish line impact our relationships with family and friends? It should impact everything that you do, everything that I do in relation to my friends, because there will be a time when I won't be able to say to them, for example, um, I do, we, you and I text and send emails back and forth. And almost every time I finish that memo, that text with, I love you. 
why wouldn't I tell you that? You're my brother in Christ. And, and I think this is something that, that men don't do as well at. Um, in fact, I love the story. It's a true story. Two pastors walking down the sidewalk. One of them collapses to the ground. He's dead before his body hits the pavement. And his friend kneels down next to him and he's pounding on his chest. And people gathered around and the man, the people think, well, he's his friend, he's dying, right? That he was saying something and he was saying, don't die until I tell you how much I love you. Mm. Why would we wait? Why would we wait to let people know how dear they are to us, mm. how much we love them, how much they've meant to us in our lives? Um, so that's, you keep short accounts because we don't know. We don't know. We, 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 tomorrow's not guaranteed. Absolutely not. So why, why would I not keep short accounts? I mean, and that's true of families. That's true of friends. It's incredibly important. Robert, you also say in your book, uh, and I love the practical tips nature of your book. You say, no more secrets. D don't keep secrets from your family and friends. What do you mean by that? We have a friend who died and didn't leave any of his passwords to his family, and they still can't get into his stuff. No more secrets. So I hired two young men 17 years ago. And I brought them into my office and I said, I looked at my desk, looked at the drawers, looked at the credenza, my computer was back there. And I said, I want you to know that while you're working for me, I'm hiding nothing. You can go through anything. You can go through my memos or my files or anything. There's no, there are no secrets. Now, people could say, well, that's very admirable. No, that's actually, it's a confession. If I know that people are going to go through my stuff, I'm going to be careful about how I live and what I say and what I write because there will be no more secrets. People are gonna dig through my stuff. Mm. And so that's what that chapter is about. Get, get it taken care of before it's too late. 30% of us won't have a chance, so do it now. You also talk about during Bobby's diagnosis and her illness that you and your daughters made some declarations that were very, very important to help you cope and process through this time. Can you talk about those? I sure can. This, this happened when, this is on February 12th, 2012. And we got a diagnosis that we sat down with the, with the doctor, <clears throat> my, my daughter and I did. And she said, we did our best, but your wife's body is filled with cancer. She said it was like peanut butter. Just her insides were completely covered with cancer. So Missy and I said, okay, here's what we're gonna say. These are talking points, right? And we're gonna tell everybody who asks us about this. We're not, an, we're, we're not angry, we're not afraid. We're gonna treat this as a gift. By definition, something that you didn't know that you were gonna get, but we're gonna treat it like a gift. Yeah. And the most important thing is, even though we would love for Bobby to be healed, it's even more important that her life be a legacy, a witness for Christ, and that mm. people would come to know him as a result of her life. Yes, and praise that, the Lord. And that was it. And that exactly is what happened. How do you hang on to those things with such strong emotions that are fighting against everything in you <laughs> wants to just, just say, no, no. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's hanging on to the truth, right? So emotion, is this where theology is important? Come and, is this oh, where man, prayer is absolutely. important? Is this absolutely. where singing hymns yes, is important? Yes, yes, and yes, yes. So it's, it's really interesting. The spotlight shines on stuff that you really do believe when you get to that place in your life. So what that does is that calls us to live worthy of the redemption that's ours in Christ. Not that we could ever earn it, but live like a in free man. In honor of it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Robert, this, this has been such a great conversation. I, I wish we had more time we to talk more oh, and no. more. But people can uh, read in your book, uh, Advice to Caregivers. And, uh, and those who are caring for someone the way that you cared for Bobby. Um, could we just close our time together by maybe you just speaking to someone who might be watching here, who's going through a grieving process, mm -hmm. either about their own life as they approach a finish line or there with someone that they love who's approaching the finish line. Well, thank you for the privilege of being here. And this is a very serious conversation. We're talking about death. We're talking about my death and your death, and it's inevitable. And here's, the, here's the, the capstone of all of this. Be ready. There's, a, there's an expression in golf that when the, when the course is filled, you don't wait your turn. If you get to your golf ball, you hit it. It's called ready golf. And the time to be ready is right now. In fact, in the book, I talk about planning your funeral. 
before you die. Your, your family should never say, well, I wonder what Robert would have wanted here. Take care of all of that. This is, for, this is for your survivors. This is for your family. But it's also for heaven. The, 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 the assurance of heaven is absolutely yours. You don't have to wonder about that. That's God's promise to us. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who live. This is coming down the steps in your footy pajamas, seeing the tree and all the stuff below it. God has prepared the most amazing thing for those who love him. That's my challenge to all of us.